Kevin is really remarkable, as I have learned from uh, studying his CV. You already know that he's uh, from JPL because that was in the announcement. Um, but he's leading a lab there called the Ocean World Lab, which I imagine we're going to hear a lot about, and um, proposing a, a Europa Lander concept, which he's, he's going to tell us about also. But it's not just that. I had assumed you would be an expert in, in oceans elsewhere, but uh, as, your, as your title and abstract promise, you're also an expert in, in our oceans. And um, he, as it happened, and one of the coolest things, he's made nine dives to the bottom of the ocean and was part of, uh, he was on board Cameron's 2012 dive to the bottom of the Mariana Trench and has been in an expedition in 2003 to the hydrothermal vents in uh, the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean. So he really knows about it. So I think we'll have a lot of fun. I propose I, I uh, leave it all to him and uh, then we'll have questions at the end, uh, except as ones that come up as pertinent. So uh, take a, off, uh, Kevin, thank you. So well, thank you so much, Clance, for that kind introduction and uh, a pleasure to be here. Um, wish I well, wish I could be there in person. I don't know what I mean by here, but um, hopefully in the not too distant future, uh, I'll return to uh, travel. Um, so uh, uh, as Gunnis mentioned, um, uh, my research background covers quite a, a diversity of, of topics. Um, I'm not going to go much into the Earth ocean exploration work today, uh, but Suffice to say that uh, I, I think everyone appreciates that when it comes to Mars exploration, our, uh, our program at NASA and within JPL has been from the um, exploration of desert environments like the Mojave and the Atacama and using our robotic vehicles out in those environments to test them out. And in so doing, those teams have learned a lot about Archean rocks on Earth while also advancing the capability to um, explore Mars with rovers. When we think about these ocean worlds beyond Earth, as I'll detail today, uh, the exploration of both with humans and robots uh, of our ocean and our cryosphere um, provides a similar sort of pathway where, as we think about getting into Europa's ocean or Enceladus's ocean, we need to develop the tools and technology that will someday be used there and test them out in our ocean and in our cryosphere. And so that's uh, is some of the, the logic and rationale. And, and I've got a team of engineers uh, with whom I work and we develop these CubeSats for the sea, uh, small uh, robotic craft that, that we're using to explore the ocean, as well as uh, really trying to um, leverage a lot of the instrumentation that's been developed for use on spacecraft, but now convert it into utility for the ocean. So we can go into more on that uh, uh, later, but uh, this slide provides a little bit of a, of a, a smorgasbord of, of um, my tools and techniques. I do wanna put in a, an absolutely shameless plug for my book here, Alien Oceans. Uh, after a decade of work on this, it came out on April 7th of 2020, uh, which of course, as we all appreciate, is when the world shut down. Uh, and even though people started reading more of uh, the, the talks and everything for, uh, for the book release got canceled. Um, and so everything that I talked about today is detailed uh, chapter by chapter in, uh, in my book. And it's targeted at, at the popular science audience. There is quite a bit about the origin of life uh, and different, uh, different modalities for the origin of life uh, detailed in that book. And I'll get into to some of that today. So to begin with, um, the search for life beyond Earth is in uh, part the story of our beautiful blue marble reaching out into our solar system and beyond uh, to search for potential signs of life beyond Earth. And this beautiful diagram put together by National Geographic shows a line for each of the robotic spacecraft that NASA and other space agencies uh, have launched two various worlds. Uh, the brighter lines are the successful missions, the dull lines are failed missions. And as you can see, there have been many missions to our moon, to Mars, even to Venus, uh, 
and just a few of those lines extend out beyond the asteroid belt. And these lines represent spacecraft with names like Voyager and Pioneer, Galileo, Cassini, Juno, and, and more recently, the New Horizons spacecraft that went out to, to Pluto. And by merit of these few spacecraft, we've made many discoveries about planet formation, uh, evolution of our solar system, and arguably what I would consider one of the most profound of discoveries is that we now have good reason to predict that oceans exist beyond Earth. And here's what I like to call sort of the, the, the portrait of the ocean worlds in our solar system. Uh, around the Earth, uh, which of course harbors the ocean that we, we know and love and need to protect, uh, around the Earth, I've placed six moons of the outer solar system. Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, three moons of Jupiter, Titan and Enceladus, two moons of Saturn, and I've even placed Triton, uh, Neptune's curious moon, uh, in this class of, of ocean worlds. These are worlds that are predominantly covered in ice. In the case of Titan, it's, it's got an icy shell, and overlaying uh, uh, on top of that icy shell is a thick atmosphere. But beneath the icy shells of these worlds, uh, we have good reason to predict that these liquid water oceans exist. They are there today, and in many cases, we think they have persisted for much of the history of the solar system. And in that context, these worlds are really transforming our understanding of what it takes for a world to be habitable. In the early days of solar system exploration and planetary science, our conception of habitability was such that uh, everything revolved, to use an appropriate term, around the distance from your, your primary star. Uh, and Venus, Earth, and Mars set up this wonderful little Goldilocks scenario where in order to be habitable, you had to be a world with an ocean on your surface in contact with an atmosphere. And in order to, to maintain and sustain such an ocean, you had to be at the equivalent irradiance or energetic distance of one astronomical unit from your parent star. Uh, in the case of our solar system, of course, it is one astronomical unit, but you can scale that for various um, uh, stars on the Hertz and Russell diagram. And so in our case, Venus is too hot, Mars is too cold. Uh, that's a vast oversimplification, but what these ocean worlds of the outer solar system are telling us is that this is an old Goldilocks. There is a new Goldilocks for habitability, and it's one wherein the energy for maintaining and sustaining liquid water oceans comes not from your parent star, but rather from the tidal tug and pull that worlds feel as they orbit giant planets, such as Jupiter and Saturn. And so shown here is Io. And Io is perhaps the most dramatic example of tidal energy dissipation. Io, we don't think has, or it definitely does not have an ocean, um, but Io is the most volcanically active body in our solar system. Io is more volcanically active than the Earth. And uh, in this little inset, you can see a volcanic plume erupting near the North Pole of Io. Uh, chances are there's a volcanic eruption occurring on Io right now. And in this sort of new Goldilocks scenario where tidal energy, the squeezing, tugging, and mechanical uh, energy that, that occurs as these moons trace out their slightly elliptical orbits, around giant planets. In this new Goldilocks scenario, Io can be seen as sort of the analog to Venus. Uh, any liquid water that Io may have once had, it long since lost because it's got too much tidal energy. And while Callisto might be sort of the analog to Mars, uh, Callisto we think may have a subsurface liquid water ocean, but there are a lot of question marks about exactly what's happening in the interior of Callisto. Uh, if it's got tidal energy dissipation, it's just a whiff of, of tidal energy dissipation. Uh, there may be significant radiogenic decay so as to maintain a, a liquid water layer. But um, uh, if nothing else, Callisto's liquid water ocean were it to exist is trapped beneath a very thick and old ice shell as evidenced by that, that dark pockmarked uh, surface. Each of those little dots represents a crater. And of course, in planetary science, uh, 
craters are an indication of an old surface. So in the middle, we've got Europa and Ganymede, and Europa in particular may occupy this new sweet spot of habitability, this, this um, new Goldilocks zone, where it's got just the right amount of tidal energy dissipation so as to maintain a subsurface liquid water ocean, but the ice shell above that ocean is perhaps a few to as many as 20 kilometers in thickness. And as I'll detail, we think that that ocean on Europa is cycling through a rocky sea floor, which then uh, leaches out many of the elements that are needed for life and some of that sea floor energy via hydrothermal vents may also uh, help power, uh, may give, help give rise to life and, uh, and sustain life through time. So of course, uh, much of the, uh, the interest and excitement about these ocean worlds is because if we've learned anything from life on Earth, it's at where you find the liquid water, you find life, um, and, and water as the solvent is the constant for life as we know it whether it's uh, liquid water in transient environments in the Antarctic, as shown at the bottom right, or hot springs in the Rift Valley or hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean, uh, all life on Earth from life in extreme environments to life of extreme lifestyles, uh, it needs liquid water. Of course, were I there in the, uh, in the room, uh, there, there would be laughter about uh, Mick Jagger and, and uh, Keith Richards, uh, uh, hopefully, Students still appreciate these crazy rock stars. I like to show this slide for another reason though, and that is that for all of the diversity of life on earth from the most extreme of microbe to the craziest of rock star, we are all connected by the same fundamental biochemistry. And that's pretty profound. Uh, we all run on the DNA, RNA, ATP paradigm of life. And one of the kind of parallel transformations that has occurred over the past roughly 60 years uh, along the same timeline that we've also really advanced our exploration of our solar system is that the field of biology has really been revolutionized. This is what the tree of life looked like back in the 1950s. Uh, trilobites and dinosaurs and, and Australopithecus on up to Homo sapiens. Fast forward to the modern uh, day, this is what our tree of life looks like. It's dominated by microbes. We've got uh, the bacteria, the archaea, the eukaryotes, of course, all animals and uh, all humans. We're down in a tiny little branch on the bottom right here. And we've really come to appreciate and understand the connectivity of uh, life large and small and all of the mechanisms that help uh, drive life here on Earth, and we have yet to find anything that is not connected to this tree um, within our own ecosystem here on Earth. There's lots of speculation about shadow biospheres and how there may have been different origins uh, billions of years ago that eventually got wiped out. But for all of our exploration of life on Earth, uh, we have yet to find anything that is different from uh, this tree of life. And so part of what these ocean worlds of the outer solar system represent is prime real estate to probe this question of whether or not there has been a second or perhaps third, fourth, fifth origin of life out there in our own backyard in our solar system. Uh, if you rerun the, the geochemical clock, does the same biochemistry emerge? Uh, on Europa, on Enceladus, as, as I'll uh, describe, we think we may have the liquid water and ingredients needed for life. Does that mean that DNA is, a, um, is likely to arise or might there be some other uh, large information storage molecule that, uh, that can arise under similar conditions? We don't know, but we can do this sort of last great experiment. And to that end, uh, we learn a lot about our own origins. Um, in this diagram, you can see this kind of bottom up and top down approach for trying to understand uh, life's origins. We can take the bottom approach, bottom up approach, looking at the formation of our planet and a stable hydrosphere and then some of the prebiotic chemistry, uh, perhaps made most famous by the uh, Miller-Urey experiments and many permutations of which have been um, examined in the subsequent decades. 
And then on the top down uh, approach, we can look at, as I mentioned, the tree of life, uh, the diversity of that life, and picking away at the genes uh, and the RNA to see uh, what is kind of the, uh, the, the minimal unit for the functionality of life itself. And what we find is that there's this gap uh, with respect to understanding exactly how and where life may have originated. I would say, and I think uh, many of my colleagues would agree that for the most part, we can um, distill that gap from a, a, an environmental level down to uh, just a few locales, a few suspect sites uh, on the early earth or other places. So uh, hot springs, places like Yellowstone that may have formed on some of the earliest continents, hydrothermal vents in the bottom of our, of our Hadean or Archean oceans, or tide pools on the shores of ancient oceans. And when we think about worlds beyond Earth, uh, we can think about the ways in which those worlds satisfy our desire to understand these kinds of modalities. So just as one good example, uh, I'm involved with the search for life on Mars. And Mars, we think, once was perhaps more Earth-like that uh, requires going back in time about three and a half billion years. And on Mars, we might have had hot springs, we might have had hydrothermal vents, we might have had, had tide pools. Uh, and so a lot of the same origins of life modalities that could work on Earth also work on Mars. And that's great. The problem that I have with Mars is, is twofold. Um, now, don't get me wrong, I love Mars exploration. I'm not saying anything. Uh, this is this is not an indictment of uh, of our program. Uh, I think we're doing exactly the right thing. But two issues. One is, of course, uh, given the the proximity of Mars to Earth, early on in the solar system, uh, it's been shown that transfer of material between Earth and Mars would have been relatively easy uh, compared to say transferring material between uh, Earth and the Jovian system or Saturnian system. And so uh, if Earth and Mars were sharing rocks early on, might they have shared microbes? Might they have shared life itself? Might life on Mars have originated first and seeded life on Earth, perhaps, or uh, vice versa? So if we go to Mars and find DNA-based life, um, we would not uh, be able to exclude the possibility that one planet seeded the other, and therefore we would not necessarily have a an example of a second origin. Now, the second uh, issue with Mars is that we are not actually searching for extant life. We are searching for life as preserved in the ancient rock record, as I mentioned, um, three and a half billion year old rocks. And that's great. The, the Perseverance rover, uh, uh, the, the Curiosity rover, could turn the corner tomorrow and see a geologic bed form that's got undulations indicative of what we call stromatolites or fossilized microbes. And that would um, be a tremendous discovery. But on Earth, in rocks that are all that old, we, we never find large organic molecules. We never find anything like DNA or, or uh, for that matter, RNA. Uh, all we're left with are kind of trace highly debated organics, uh, remnants of, of lipids that might have been derived from cell membranes. Uh, you really can't tease out much information about the organics in those ancient rocks. And so were we to find stromatolites on Mars, we would not understand much about that ancient biochemistry of, of life on Mars. And for me, that's a, that's a really unfortunate limitation to our understanding about how life on Mars, even at, if it were to be independent from life on Earth, uh, how life on Mars uh, uh, originated and was. Europa and Enceladus and these ocean worlds do not suffer from those two problems that I just outlined. Uh, they're distant enough that the cross-contamination issue is pretty minimal. Uh, and were you to discover DNA-based life on Europa, uh, that I would argue is an indication of convergent evolution, not of, of seeding from life on Earth. So just to kind of summarize some of this uh, comparative origins, when we think about uh, 
the primordial soup or hydrothermal environments or, or um, another um, mo um, environment that I, that I have not touched on yet, which is a, a cold, icy origins. Uh, and then I touched on planetary transfer. Uh, these ocean worlds of the outer solar system, were we to find life on those worlds, we could rule out um, tide pools and Yellowstone-like hotspots. Uh, we could essentially say that life does not need continents to originate. Uh, Europa, Enceladus, there, there's no continents there. And so these worlds would provide a second data point um, uh, with, a, with um, supporting a hydrothermal origins or uh, origins within uh, a cryosphere. And um, I'll, I'll finish with some of the origin of life uh, stuff here just by making reference to uh, this chapter, uh, again, a shameless plug in my book, it's called the Periodic Table for Life, where I, I go through not just the idea of, um, uh, of alternatives to DNA and, and RNA and proteins, but also what the ramifications might be for a different solvent, and then looking at Titan, where there might be a non-polar solvent that could give rise to uh, um, life that uses methane as a means for dissolving compounds that are then stitched together in different ways. And then if you go down through this, this tree on the left, you can see I go through polar uh, uh, solvents, water, carbon, silicon, DNA, RNA, and even within uh, that realm, you can think about uh, eight bases, six bases, four bases, two bases. And if you're trying to construct a periodic table, you can then think about the elemental building blocks and the solvent and the key molecule. So if you're very interested in this topic, I encourage you to, um, to check out that chapter. Kevin, uh, there's a question from the audience. Miriam Mojaz yeah, has let's, it let's from the Zoom it. audience. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. So, um, so two quick questions. So one thing I already mentioned here, which is right, Titan is a methane world, right? Ocean world. Correct. Um, and so that was really interesting. So, so you mentioned it could be a different solvent because water might not be necess not necessarily necessary, right? The second one was so mentioned uh, kind of the, the, the conditions for life arising and you mentioned kind of the hot aspects, right? These um, thermal geysers and so forth. So what is the kind of current understanding of um, heat, right? I mean, can you just kind of briefly yeah. kind of, uh, because then you said, you know, it could be also really icy. <laughs> so that's right. like the opposite. So would you mind just kind of briefly sure. summarizing what the understanding yeah. is? Yeah, uh, that, 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 that's a, uh, let's see, I didn't, I didn't catch your name. I'm sorry. And then uh, it disappeared. Miriam Mojan. Miriam. <laughs> uh, great. So uh, Miriam, yeah, Miriam, yes. Uh, uh, so I love that question. And um, yeah, and uh, I kind of breezed over that uh, here where certainly in the hydrothermal uh, event uh, paradigm, uh, there's a lot of debate about exactly that issue, high temperature versus low temperature. Um, and the problem with high temperature is you break apart those molecules. And so many people in the hydrothermal vent origin of life community argue for an alkaline low temperature serpentinizing geochemical system that is simply put a lot sort of softer for the origin of life. Now the problem with the al alkaline low temperature uh, environment is that in those hydrothermal vents you do not find much iron sulfur chemistry. You, you do find a bit but part of the early attraction to, to hydrothermal vents was the black smoker chemistry of, of pyrite and other um, iron sulfur um, minerals that provide a nice catalyst for organic synthesis. And the iron sulfur chemistry of black smokers is typically at these higher temperature hydrothermal vents. Now, just to dive into that in a little more detail, the primordial soup contingent, the, the folks who argue for tide pools and continents say that there's no way life could originate at, um, at, at a hydrothermal vent because you've got this problem of too much water. When you, when you um, uh, take two amino acids and try and form a, 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 a polymer, try and link together two amino acids, you spit out a water molecule in that um, binding of two amino acids. And just the, trying to drive a chemical reaction that produces a water molecule when you are surrounded by an ocean full of water is not 
advantageous. And that has kind of long been the, the um, argument against hydrothermal vent origins. What people in the hydrothermal vent community say is, well, no, what's actually happening is within the vesicles of these hydrothermal chimneys where the catalytic surface overcomes the, uh, the water problem. And so folks who argue for tides and, and, and hot springs and continents, they say, well, we can get around the water problem through desiccation. You've got tide pools that lap onto these ancient shores. The tide goes out. Now you've got uh, the sun baking those ancient shores. Um, and, uh, and you can dry things out. And now you can start to bind them together. So there's a lot of debate, um, and I see strengths and weaknesses in, in both. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, part of what's beautiful about solar system exploration is uh, for all of our frustrations of trying to recreate these experiments in the lab, uh, and we can do them with decent fidelity, we just can't uh, run the experiments fast enough. Uh, for all of the frustration of trying to replicate this stuff in the lab, we can, granted, at the cost of a billion dollars or so, go out and explore these worlds where um, Mother Nature has been running this experiment for us uh, on, these, uh, on these ocean worlds. Uh, other questions? Um, on yeah, I, I, I have another question, if possible. <clears throat> uh, when I go to Yellowstone Park and see these uh, uh, vents, they seem to be working sort of constantly, day and night and so on. On the other hand, when people uh, uh, speculate at least about what could have happened in primordial soup, uh, one of the lines of thinking is, is this cycles, at least 24 hour cycles of light and, and darkness, uh, heat and cold and, and other cycles. So my question is, uh, I simply don't know, uh, deep ocean vents, are there any uh, peri periodicities, any, uh, anything that is driven periodically for some reason in, in the depths of our oceans? And the, if there are speculations about other oceans? Yeah, it's a really interesting uh, question. And, and on the one hand, the, the, the periodicity argument, the, the desiccation, the, the uh, cyclic nature nature of, of drying things out and then re-wetting. Um, I worry that some of that is special pleading, at least when considering the, the Hadean environment, the earliest environment on Earth, where um, frankly, it's still unclear exactly when continents appeared. And, and in some cases, when you look at the, the ancient zircons from, from Australia and the kind of stabilization of our, of our hydrosphere, uh, some of the implication is that life arose very quickly. And so, um, uh, and, and back then, of course, tides would have been operating on, on more like a, a six hour schedule because the, the moon was much closer. Um, life uh, and, and the stabilization of Earth's ocean may have uh, uh, arisen in, in close cadence with the, uh, the cooling of our moon. So, uh, there are lots of different angles for periodicity with respect to tide pools. Uh, some of those arguments I find compelling, others I find uh, weak. When it comes to hydrothermal vents, in the modern epic of what's happening on our seafloor, you can sort of think of hydrothermal vents as a, um, uh, a hot point under a piece of metal and the hydrothermal vents migrate. So. As one example, I, I got to dive along uh, Nine North uh, along the East Pacific Rise. This is sort of a, a classic um, hydrothermal vent, vent site. And there's an eruption time scale there today of uh, roughly once a decade um, as the hot spot kind of migrates along the East Pacific Rise. And so when I dove on that site in 2003, I was there shortly after a volcanic eruption, which I gotta admit was a little bit nerve wracking because you, know, you, you actually see these, these uh, 
uh, um, lava tubes and, and basaltic, these fresh uh, flows in the bottom of the ocean. Uh, and so there is a bit of a reset, at least in the modern era, where every 10 years in a site like that, the whole hot spring, uh, the whole hydrothermal landscape gets uh, paved over by, by um, uh, fresh basalt and new vents pop up. And given the ocean flow and the, the predominance of life in our ocean in the modern epoch, uh, tube worms and other creatures rapidly spawn around those new vents. What that implies for an ancient ocean where life does not yet exist, whether or not um, the periodicity would have been, uh, is 10 years long enough for a hydrothermal vent to give rise to the origin of life? Um, is that what the periodicity would have been back in the Archean time period? Um, uh, might it have been longer? Might it have been shorter? Would there have been a diversity of uh, different time scales and geochemistries in, in the early ocean? Um, there's a lot of work going on trying to understand that right now. I don't think we have a, a clear answer. Um, but one of the things that I think I can say with confidence is that um, the uh, serpentinization geochemistry, which I, I mentioned briefly earlier. So um, serpentinization, see if I can, uh, uh, the, um, uh, somewhere here, I've actually got a rock sample from, uh, from one of the events. So um, uh, serpentinization is what happens when you take this ultramafic rock, uh, rock from the deep mantle, peridotites, and expose it to, to water. Uh, and it's an exothermic reaction that produces hydrogen, some methane, uh, and depending on exactly the, the chemistry, some carbonates precipitate. And so on early Earth, we likely would have had a lot of serpentinization uh, geochemistry occurring in our seafloor because some of that rock would have been so ultramafic, so uh, rich with the heavy elements. And it would have been exposed to that, that early hydrosphere. And so serpentinization chemistry would have proceeded um, uh, all over the place. Um, that's interesting because the release of hydrogen and methane, and in particular methane uh, in combination with carbon dioxide that would have been in Earth's early atmosphere, that's been implicated in some of the earliest um, uh, um, uh, acetic acid cycles in um, uh, methanotrophs and methanogens, some of the oldest uh, microbial lineages that we can trace in, in the Earth's tree of life. So when we look at the tree of life, just coming back here, um, Methanogens and methan you know, this is not a time chart. We can't really go back in time, but you can look at the uh, the genes in the diversity of, of organisms, and and essentially get a little bit of a clock for what are the most primordial of metabolisms. And it looks like um, exhaling and consuming methane and carbon dioxide are some of the oldest metabolic pathways. And so serpentinization geochemistry nicely couples with that earliest uh, potential uh, metabolism. And so I think on early earth, we would have had a lot of serpentinization geochemistry on the seafloor, uh, probably quite a bit more than we have today where serpentinization sites are relatively rare compared to the, to the black smoker hydrothermal events. Um, so I, uh, I kind of went on a few different threads there, but hopefully that-, uh, that Okay, was... yeah, that was a great answer. Thank you. And I have another question, if you allow me. Uh, yeah, this is more fun for me, uh, uh, chatting than, uh, than listening to myself. I don't know, maybe Glennis wants somebody else to, to, to enter this. Uh, uh, anyways. Go ahead, sir. If, 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 if... Kevin will have an idea. If we're going too far afield and he this is great. cares for the coherence, uh, he'll tell us. But Or we can hold it to the end. 
Well, let, let, let's, you be the uh, judge, Shura. Um, so I I know that uh, uh, Europa Ocean uh, is salty, roughly to the same extent than our oceans on Earth. As far as I understand, it is measured by electric conductivity of, of, of this ocean. Uh, what is known, I don't know about oceans of other uh, of these can candidate worlds. In, in terms of salinity. Right, and, and so I'll get into that in a, in a little bit. Oh, sorry. Yeah, in, uh, in the upcoming talk. No, no, it's a, uh, it's a perfect lead in actually. It's a, it's a great question for, um, uh, uh, for the coming section, but simply put, um, we do have some constraints for Enceladus and as you mentioned, Europa, uh, but beyond that, it's really gonna take future missions to go and uh, Okay. Uh, and, and help us better constrain uh, the salinity. And the salinity is interesting in the context of the origin of life, because as, as some oh, of yes. colleagues have shown, if you get too salty, it's bad news for um, formation of, of, of polymers and peptides. Um, uh, conversely, uh, if it's too fresh, you may not have enough um, in the way of catalytic surfaces to help motivate some of that chemistry. Okay, so uh, that's a great transition to um, some, uh, some of the big picture uh, bringing us to the outer solar system. So in the, in the next section, um, I'm only gonna go through Enceladus and Europa, as much as I love Titan and these other ocean worlds, just in the interest of time, I won't, I won't detail them. But the, the, the primary question here is the consideration of, of uh, do these ocean worlds have the ingredients for life? And here I'll put the caveat as we know it. Uh, liquid water-based life and carbon-based life for that matter. And, and how do we think we know? So uh, of course, much of that uh, begins with the spacecraft. Shown at left is the Cassini spacecraft and the spacecraft assembly facility at JPL. Uh, on the left-hand side there, that capsule is the, the Huygens probe that uh, plummeted through the atmosphere of Titan and, and landed on the surface. In the upper right is the Galileo spacecraft. Uh, this, this beautiful image by the way, you, you don't typically get a picture of a, uh, of a robotic spacecraft in space like this, um, but Galileo was launched from the space shuttle after many delays due to tragically the, the Challenger explosion in 86. Um, but after Galileo was launched from the shuttle or deployed from the shuttle, I should say, uh, the astronauts were able to take this beautiful image uh, before it headed off on its journey. And as amazing as the spacecraft are, they are useless without the ear on the ground, deep space network. And as I'll describe later, uh, the deep space network is particularly important to understanding the interiors of these worlds. So here's Saturn, the, the home of Enceladus. Uh, of course, Saturn uh, uh, marked by its rings. Uh, here's Enceladus with Saturn and its rings in the background. Uh, and just focusing in on Enceladus, it is a curiously small world. Uh, it's just 500 kilometers in diameter, or 300 miles. Um, and uh, if you focus in on Enceladus, you immediately see this bizarre dichotomy. To the north, uh, it's pockmarked by craters. And as I mentioned earlier in the context of Callisto, these craters are an indication of an old surface. And if you just take the craters at face value, um, my colleagues who do the, the crater counting and age dating, I've estimated that the, the northern hemisphere of Enceladus is in the range of about three to three and a half billion years old. Meanwhile, to the south, you see essentially no craters. And along with the paucity of craters, you see these bizarre parallel fractures. Uh, these have come to be known as the tiger stripes. And when the Cassini team first saw these tiger stripes, of course, every, everybody's interest was, uh, was piqued. And uh, they asked the engineers uh, directing the spacecraft to get uh, just the right approach angle so we could get an oblique view. And I say we, I wasn't actually on the team. I was, I was still in, in, personally in grad school at the, uh, at the time. I was out at JPL doing work, but I was struggling through some old Galileo data trying to make sense of it. So uh, the, the Cassini team uh, asked the engineers to figure out how to do a, uh, 
an oblique approach to Enceladus. So the lighting geometry would be such that these tiger stripes could be investigated in more detail. And this is what they saw. Um, many of you have probably seen this image before. Uh, if um, again, if I were in the the art, or if I were in the symposium in there, hopefully I would be hearing some oohs and ahs, because this truly is a phenomenal image. What you're looking at here are jets of water erupting out of the fractures near the south pole of Enceladus. And these are jets, not just of liquid water, but as I'll describe, um, within these jets, the Cassini spacecraft detected uh, salts, um, uh, hydrogen, uh, and even uh, both small and some indications of, of larger organics. Now, interestingly, even though these jets appear quite dramatic uh, with just the right sun angle, uh, when you look down directly on Enceladus' surface, uh, you do not see them. This, this is not like looking at a snowmaking machine at a, a ski area. Uh, these jets are, are quite diffuse. And so um, in these images, some of the highest resolution images of Enceladus' surface, we're looking at about uh, 10 meters per pixel here and uh, 10 to 20 meters per pixel. But you can see, even though there's no uh, obvious jet, in the bottom middle of this image, there's a, there's a dark hole down one of these crevasses. And around that dark hole, the, the surface has been softened. And we think that potentially that's an indication of uh, Enceladian snow settling down onto the fractured surface covering up um, uh, some of the, the, the fractured ice. And so this is, we think, an area where some of those jets are erupting out. Now, thankfully, along with the, the uh, amazing camera that Cassini had on board, it also had two mass spectrometers. Um, and the first uh, of which is called the on and neutral mass spectrometer. And the early results from uh, the Cassini spacecraft with respect to the composition of the Enceladian plumes is shown at the upper left. Uh, and what you see there is a mass spectrum. Um, they, the, uh, as great as this instrument was, it, uh, it could only go up to 100 Daltons or 100 atomic mass units. And so in the early results, what we uh, discovered was methane along with the water, some simple organics, some carbon monoxide, they indicate here complex organics. I kind of take a little bit of issue with that, that verbiage, uh, but nevertheless, that clustering green around uh, 40 Daltons is perhaps an indication of smaller organics cracked off of larger organics. And then you see at, at 44 carbon dioxide. Now, this was incredibly exciting to the team and to the broader community, but while some initially went to these plumes being connected to a, a subsurface ocean, uh, many of us were a little more cautious and, and a little more suspect because this kind of mass spectrum uh, is somewhat similar to what you see in comets. Uh, comets have organics, they've got methane, they've got uh, um, water, of course, and these jets coming out of Enceladus looked sort of cometary. Now, how do you actually make that happen uh, on a moon that's, that's orbiting Saturn? That was, of course, up for debate. But just trying to take the more conservative hypothesis, a number of us um, uh, stayed a bit reserved on our interpretation uh, after these initial publications. But then in the 2009 uh, timeframe, the other mass spectrometer, the Comic Dust Analyzer, found evidence for um, sodium chloride and variations on sodium chloride and other salts. And those spectra are shown in the middle, uh, the top middle. And that's where, uh, at least in my case, I, I really started to get convinced that we were uh, seeing jets of water that were connected to a subsurface ocean. And the reason for that is because, well, we don't see salts on comets. Uh, and so it requires a, a bit of a different interpretation. Uh, and salts are really an indicator of liquid water leaching through silicate rocks. Uh, in other words, you need water and rock interactions. And uh, the implication there is that you've got liquid water in the subsurface. So once we had the salt data from the CBA instrument, uh, I really um, I started to get on board with Enceladus having a subsurface ocean. And then as more flybys occurred, 
uh, nanophase silica was, was measured as shown in the bottom right. And then uh, in some of the last flybys, a uh, pretty convincing detection of hydrogen was revealed. And those last two results, the nanophase silica and the hydrogen, really pointed to a, um, a, a tie of the plume chemistry, not to, just to a salty ocean, but also to an ocean that has uh, active hydrothermalism going on. Um, now, uh, <laughs> this picture, of course, is not from Enceladus, uh, despite that lead-in. Uh, this is a picture that I took uh, of our own ocean. This is a, uh, in the Atlantic, uh, a, a bizarre hydrothermal vent. Uh, and uh, just as an example of what we think may be occurring uh, deep within the, the ocean of Enceladus. And, and curiously, so our, our current conception of Enceladus is this, where that South Pole has the, has the plumes. Uh, that South Polar region is geologically very young. The ice shell may be quite thin around the South Pole. Uh, some have speculated just a few kilometers. And then perhaps it thickens to 50 or more kilometers in other regions of, uh, of the shell. Then you've got this ocean that's perhaps tens of kilometers in thickness. And then beneath that is this, um, this interior, this rocky interior that may or may not be differentiated. And for the most part, I would say at this stage of the interpretation of the Cassini data, uh, the, the consensus is that Enceladus, in, Enceladus's interior as uh, consistent with this image is not differentiated. In other words, there's not a denser iron core overlain by, by silicates. And that's interesting uh, in contrast with Europa. Um, for the sake of the hydrothermal, hydrothermalism, uh, it kind of raises the question of how long could that hydrothermal activity be sustained? Is Enceladus sort of this glorified Alka-Seltzer tablet that's just kind of fizzing away for a brief period of time? And eventually when the, the geochemical battery runs down, will that hydrothermal, hydrothermalism uh, stop? Uh, we just don't know, but that's, uh, that's part of where the current state of knowledge uh, leaves off. So with that, I'll then transfer to uh, or transition to Europa, a, a much larger world. Europa is about 3,000 kilometers in diameter. That's a, a, about the size of our moon, shown here uh, to scale with respect to the Earth and with respect to, to Jupiter itself. And, uh, and just to put that tidal energy dissipation in context, we of course all know and love the, the rise and fall of the tides in our ocean. Now just imagine you're standing on Europa, uh, orbiting in a slightly elliptical uh, orbit around Jupiter. And that slightly elliptical orbit, just as a, a small uh, tangent, is maintained by what's called the Laplace resonance, a, a, a tug and pull between Europa, Io, and Ganymede, kind of like kids on a swing set, uh, keeping each other from, from settling down into a in this case, a, a circular orbit where you then wouldn't have as much tidal dissipation. So Europa is on a slightly elliptical, slightly eccentric orbit, and Jupiter is 318 times as massive as the Earth. And so the predictions are that if you could stand on Europa without dying because it's too cold and the radiation environment is tremendous, if you could stand on Europa, you would rise and fall by about 100 feet or 30 meters every 3.55 days, which is the, uh, the orbital cycle of, of Europa around Jupiter. So that gives you a little bit of a sense for uh, how, how dramatic that experience uh, that Europa is having with respect to its, its tidal dynamics. And now I just want to spend a little bit of time getting into to why we think we know Europa has an ocean. And this is an interesting contrast with Enceladus. Um, at Enceladus, as I just described, the ocean was jumping out at us and the Cassini spacecraft, spacecraft saw the jets and then was able to ask the question and answer the question of where do those jets arise from and we could connect it back to a subsurface ocean. The Galileo spacecraft had all sorts of issues with its high gain antenna and the data return and so a lot of the, um, the prime mission was, was modified and we didn't get as much imagery or, or uh, data on other instruments as, as initially desired. Uh, and so no jets or plumes were observed in the imagery that was available. That's not to say they don't exist. I'll touch on a bit of that later. But, um, but the, 
the discovery of Europa's ocean, I would argue, is, a, is potentially more compelling. And it's a very elegant and beautiful progression of physics. And I like to break it into these three easy pieces. In the interest of time, I'm going to go through this very quickly. But uh, uh, the, the first piece of the puzzle is to find a rainbow connection. What do I mean by that? Well, much of what I do is spectroscopy. Uh, spectroscopy is a fancy term for studying rainbows. You take a rainbow, turn it on its side. Uh, you can figure out the composition of the water molecules and the composition of our sun and, and so on and so forth. So about 350 years after Galileo discovered the Jovian moons, uh, Vasily Moreau and, uh, and later Gerhard Kuiper and others were able to collect spectra of these moons. And here's one of the first spectra of, of Europa. And what's written here in Russian is a spectrum of Europa average of four scans uh, from October 1st, 1964. The zero level, the dash line, depends on the way like there's some nuances to the uh, data reduction. But what's most striking about this as Moreau and others um, uh, wrote is the, the stepwise function that you see with the absorptions at 1.5 and two microns. That is a dead ringer for an ice covered surface. And so, from Galileo to then the 1950s and 60s and 70s, we transform Europa from being this little point of light to being a point of light that we now know is covered in ice. That was the first piece of the puzzle. The next piece of the puzzle, I like to make the uh, analogy to babysitting a spacecraft. And here we return to Galileo and the, the deep space network. By carefully monitoring the trajectory of a spacecraft, as it flies by any uh, massive body, a moon or a planet or a no matter our star, uh, we can uh, track the, the slight Doppler shift in the transmissions coming from that spacecraft. And with the slight, uh, with, the, um, uh, with the analysis of the red and blue shift of the transmissions coming back, uh, we can see how the acceleration changes based on uh, on that body. And in the case of Europa, and this applies to, uh, again, any world that a spacecraft flies by, but in the case of, of Europa, you can use the, uh, um, the, the Doppler shift to get at what's called the C22 term of the gravitational potential. This is an old transparency that I wrote up now over two decades ago, but I still love it. Uh, many students today uh, have, uh, don't get the luxury of the, the transparency in these ancient markers that we used to use. But here's the gravitational potential and of course uh, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, force equation for gravity. What's important uh, here is that by carefully monitoring the Galileo spacecraft, you can tease out the moment of inertia and from the moment of inertia, you can then make some predictions uh, based on simplified models of the interior structure of, uh, of Europa. And what the moment of inertia data leads to in a three layer model case, uh, which is a reasonable estimate, is that Europa is in fact differentiated. It's got this dense iron, iron sulfur core. Over that is a less dense rocky silicate mantle. And then what the gravity data required is some lower density outer layer that's some 100 to 200 kilometers in thickness. And what the gravity data indicated is that not only does this material need to be lower density than rocks, but it's got to be in the range of about one gram per cubic centimeter. That implicates water in either liquid or solid phase. Now, the gravity data was not sufficient to differentiate the slight density difference between those two phases. But here, at least with that second piece of the puzzle, we now have indication of not just an icy surface, but also water occupying the, the, uh, the outermost layer of Europa uh, down to a depth of 100 to, to 200 uh, kilometers. So that brings us to the third piece of the puzzle here. I like to say uh, you need to adhere to airport security. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, here, I'm, uh, you know, there's lots of pretty pictures in this, in this presentation. Uh, this is not one of the prettiest pictures. This was actually uh, a picture I took at JFK many years ago. Uh, and it's blurry because I was doing my best not to get um, uh, arrested by the security guards. Uh, 
But uh, when you walk through one of the doorways at uh, airport security, what's happening? You are walking through a time varying magnetic field. Uh, a field pulsates in that doorway. And if you've got a conductor in your pocket, uh, that time varying magnetic field, as Maxwell and Faraday taught us, that time varying field excites electric uh, an induced electric field within the conductor in your pocket. That induced electric field then gives rise to an induced magnetic field. And within the doorway are sensors that are searching for induced magnetic fields. And so if you have a conductor that gives rise to induced electric currents, which then have the consequent induced magnetic field, the alarm goes off and you get pulled aside and patted down. In the case of the Galileo spacecraft flying by Europa, the alarm went off. So the Galileo spacecraft had on board a magnetometer, essentially a fancy compass. And as it flew by Europa multiple times, it detected an induced magnetic field. And by implication, that induced magnetic field uh, requires an induced electric field. And that induced electric field then requires there to be some time varying magnetic field that imparts that induced, uh, those induced electric currents. Well, we know from Jupiter that there is this time varying component of its magnetic field. And here again is a diagram I drew ages ago, but it's still beautiful physics that applies today. Uh, and the upper left is this butterfly diagram uh, where in red are the, the field lines of, of Jupiter. And by a beautiful quirk of, of solar system fate, Jupiter's magnetic field is tilted by about 9.6 degrees from the rotation axis of Jupiter. That means that if you um, break out the magnetic field vector, as I've done in the bottom left, there is a, uh, a time varying component that Europa and the other moons experience as that field sweeps around them. And so in this case, in the analogy to airport security, uh, Europa is like you walking through the doorway and Jupiter with its time varying field is like that pulsating field in the doorway. And then the sensors within the doorway are like the Galileo spacecraft. And so when the Galileo spacecraft detected that induced magnetic field with the induced uh, electric currents imparted by the time varying field of Jupiter, that then necessitates a conductor within Europa. And so that leads to the question, well, what could that conductive layer be? Might it be that iron core? Iron, of course, is conductive. Could that explain the induced field? Well, when you do the math, and I actually did quite a bit of this modeling work as part of my PhD many years ago, the iron core is, is too, small, too small and too far away. Uh, and, and though it does provide a, a, a component, uh, it's not sufficient to explain the Galileo data. Well, what about that rocky silicate um, mantle? Uh, it turns out that silicate rocks are not conductive enough, and so that doesn't get the job done. Well, what about an icy shell? Uh, ice is not conductive enough. What fits the data beautifully is a salty liquid water ocean of about 100 kilometers in depth. And when you model up that salty liquid water ocean and compare it to the Galileo data, it just fits that induced field beautifully. It's, it's amazing physics, you know, physics 101 uh, that uh, you, know, you, you learn this, uh, if not in college and in, in, in high school, or if not in high school, in college. Uh, and uh, Faraday's law, uh, Maxwell's equations, uh, help reveal this subsurface ocean. And was, as implied earlier, not only does that implicate an ocean, it implicates a salty ocean, which then also implicates a water-rock interaction, as I, as I described earlier in the context of Enceladus. So with those um, sort of three easy pieces of, of spectroscopy, gravity data, and magnetometer data, uh, we arrive at this model for Europa where it's got a 100 kilometer or so deep ocean. It's got a rocky seafloor and then this ice shell that is a few to as many as 20 kilometers in thickness. And what's perhaps most important is that that ice shell is thin enough and geologically young so as to provide a window into the ocean below. Um, so I'm just taking a quick look at time there. Glennis, we're at the nearly the top of the hour. Um, 
Uh, I've got many more things that I can go into, but I just want to do a quick check with you as I transition to uh, uh, a couple of other things. Let's see. Um, Should I keep going I for another I, two minutes and then go to questions or? Right, why don't you do a try to maybe five minutes because some people may have to go and they'll be frustrated if they miss any juicy things. I don't quite know uh, when anyway, okay. uh, you know, just use your, you, you, you have a feel for what you need to tell us. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so I'll just go into a little bit of detail on uh, further detection of salts because uh, this uh, is quite relevant to what I do in my lab. And then I'll go to a conclusion with some of the mission work. Um, and we can come back to some things related to uh, plume detections on, uh, on Europa. So uh, one of the interesting aspects of uh, Europa's surface is that it is bombarded by energetic electrons and ions uh, that uh, are, are within the magnetosphere of, uh, of Jupiter. And so, and it, to put that in context, um, the, uh, the, the if you were sitting on Europa, it would be akin to sitting high in the upper atmosphere during a large um, uh, solar event uh, where you would see quite large aurora. And I don't know, perhaps uh, if you get outside of the city, you're able to see some of the aurora that are occurring in the, the northern hemisphere now. Um, but so on Europa's surface, we have long had this question of what is this dark material? Uh, at right is one of the highest resolution images of Europa, that's a grayscale image. If this were in color, much of that material would be uh, would be brownish red. And early on in the Galileo days, there was significant debate about the spectroscopy from the Galileo mission and whether or not that spectroscopy implicated uh, salts from the ocean below. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go through these these different um, hypotheses and the. Uh, uh, the validity of the different hypotheses. I'm just going to skip to that last bullet point, which is something else altogether. Um, what is this dark material, and and why is it dark? What is uh, and what does it have to do with the ocean below? Well, here's a picture of part of my lab. Um, this is a, a, a lab uh, that I uh, built up through the years uh, in collaboration with my now retired uh, colleague Bob Carlson, who is the PI on the Galileo near and thread map mapping spectrometer, just a, a brilliant, brilliant scientist. Many years of, of uh, great work together. And um, about, I guess, six or seven years ago at this point, um, I, uh, I took some sodium chloride, uh, some, some table salt, and put it into our chambers that replicate the radiation, uh, temperature, and pressure environment of Europa. Now, spectroscopically, Alkali halides like sodium chloride are long kind of the um, an annoyance for uh, spectroscopists. Um, the spectra of sodium chloride is just flat. There, there are essentially no features. And that's consistent with just the visual observations. We all know table salt is just this, this bland white color. But, and apologies if this sound comes through a little too strong. Uh, this is, Uh, this is inside one of our chambers, irradiating a, uh, a salt evaporite, uh, essentially simulating what might happen on the surface of Europa were salty oceanic material to, to come up to the surface. And after pulling that irradiated salt out, what we found is that it turned this uh, caramelized brown, red, yellowish color. And Immediately, my eye was drawn to that because that is uh, somewhat akin to the, the color that we see uh, over Europa's surface. Now, the actual physics behind that has to do with trapped electrons. I won't go into detail on F and M center absorptions. Uh, and, and early on, I tried to connect some of our lab observations to the Galileo data, but the Galileo data was not of sufficient resolution to, to really. Um, uh, provide a definitive um, mapping of irradiated sodium chloride to Europa. But then just a, a few years ago, a brilliant grad student out Cal at Caltech with whom I was working got us some time on the Hubble Space Telescope. And by using Hubble, we were able to actually collect 
uh, spectra of Europa's surface, shown in the upper right here in black, we're able to collect spectra of Europa's surface and compare it to my lab data shown in red here. And the very distinct absorption that is attributable to irradiated sodium chloride was found on Europa's surface. And so this paper we published in 2019, uh, really nice work by Samantha Trumbo uh, and uh, myself and Mike Brown. And this, I would argue, along with the induced magnetic field signature, is our best evidence for salt on the surface of Europa, providing potentially an indication of recently exposed material, uh, as we went into on this paper, uh, perhaps recently exposed material uh, that um, is, is geologically young uh, on Europa's surface. So um, I'll just uh, skip forward to a little bit of a, a closing here on what's next for missions. Um, give me a second while I pull up this slide. Okay, well, well just before that one, I showed you a little bit of this uh, earlier. Um, so this is the highest resolution mosaic of uh, images stitched together from the Galileo spacecraft. Just a jaw-dropping uh, set of images where, again, it's grayscale. And at the highest resolution, we're about six meters per pixel. Everything in white here is water ice. This cliff that I'll stop on here is perhaps a couple of hundred meters to 300 meters in height. The dark material, the talus at the, at the edge of that cliff perhaps contains some of these irradiated salts. If this were in color, maybe it would be reddish, orange, yellow material. Uh, perhaps there's indication of organics and, and uh, life from the subsurface in that material. Uh, but at this point, this is all we're left with. Now in the months to come, the Juno spacecraft will fly by Europa and collect uh, new images of Europa for the first time since Galileo um, collected these in the early 2000s. The Juno spacecraft will get as close as 320 kilometers in, I believe it's December of 2022, so a little bit over a year. And uh, it probably won't get images as good as this, but it will get uh, some quite high resolution images that could give us indications of any new fractures or eruptions or potentially even plumes uh, on Europa. Now, after the Juno extended mission, we've got the Europa Clipper mission that is currently under construction at JPL. It will hopefully make it to the launch pad in 2024, arriving out at Jupiter uh, in 2030. Coupled with that, the European Space Agency is moving forward with the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer an acronym that they signed up for ages ago and they still have not changed despite their uh, insistence that they need to change it. And so uh, towards the end of uh, this decade, we will hopefully have these two spacecraft in the Jovian system. Uh, Europa Clipper will be in orbit around Jupiter, making 45 some on flybys around Europa. And the JUICE mission will make two flybys of Europa, a number of flybys of Callisto, and then it will go into orbit around Ganymede. And so both of those missions are, are quite exciting. We also have the Dragonfly mission, which was selected a few years ago on the COI on this mission. It will uh, parachute through Titan's atmosphere in the mid 2030s, and then use this octocopter um, mechanism to study the mid latitude dunes and other regions uh, around uh, Titan. It won't necessarily get as far north or, or south for that matter as the the methane ethane lakes, but we're hoping that it may um, be able to explore some of the shores of, uh, of other regions that may have once had that, um, that um, non-polar solvent flow into it. And then, um, as Glenn has mentioned at the beginning, uh, my sort of um, uh, dream mission is to get a lander to the surface of Europa. This mission is currently in pre-phase A, meaning that we are doing a lot of technology advancements and, and work to get this mission um, uh, through the NASA gates and, and fully funded. There's a decadal survey underway right now. 
it will come out in the spring uh, and hopefully it will prioritize this mission as one of the, the top flagship priorities for the, for the coming decade. I won't go into much detail on this. Um, if you're interested in the, the, the lander concept, these, these two links at the top here, which if you just plug in Europa lander mission concept, there's some of the first links pop, that pop up. Um, but this is a mission that uh, where we've retired a lot of the, the landing and technology risk uh, and just skipping forward here, uh, we, we leverage a lot. Oh, let me skip a little too far ahead. Um, we leverage a lot of the, the entry, descent, and landing technologies that are used on Mars, uh, a lot of the hazard avoidance capability that were just recently demonstrated on uh, the Perseverance rover. Uh, and we would utilize the Clipper data for landing site selection. So I'll, I'll finish there and we can skip back to some of, the, uh, of this material and, and go on to questions as, uh, uh, as desired. Well, thank you very, very much. That was terrific. Um, why don't we take some questions from anybody who didn't yet get a chance to ask? I can't tell if there's an audience in the room or not. Um, Yes, there is, but it seems like no one has a question at this time. Okay. <laughs> well, I have a question, but uh, anyone should super see me. So when you imagine this, this landing, um, and it would be the same, as you're not talking about bringing stuff back, but just analyzing it the way they are on Mars, but would you expect, or would you feel somewhat optimistic that I mean, for example, I, I haven't heard of, of maybe the, I'm just stupid or I'm uninformed. Um, like on Mars, would they be able to, to tell if there's DNA there? Um, part from of the, the rationale for doing a uh, sample return, which is the, the um, Mars exploration programs uh, mm -hmm. um, pathway right now, the Perseverance rover is coring rocks and those rocks will come back to Earth. And, and much of the rationale for sample return of rocks from Mars is because you can then unleash sure. all sorts of instrumentation. Right. Right. Right, right, right. And Mars, uh, given its proximity, um, uh, and in some ways, Mars sample return is, is <laughs> exactly the kind of uh, uh, artificial version of, of that, that transfer of geologic samples that I mentioned that might have occurred early on in the solar system. Uh, so the fact that doing a sample return mission is comparatively easy means that it makes sense to bring those samples back. And we, of course, would be able to look for DNA. I didn't uh, ask the question all that well, I'm sorry. But is it seems like why not use spectroscopy? Surely one could use spectroscopy to identify DNA too, or not? Yes. And, and so there is a Raman spectrometer on the Perseverance right now that in theory could identify the phosphodiester bonds that bind uh, nuclear bases together. So, um, uh, so in theory, the Raman spectrometer in part combined with an X-ray fluorescence spectrometer that's on there could give us some, some hints of, of DNA. Now that said, given how old the rocks are, both at Gusa or at the Gale Crater and, um, uh, and Jezero Crater, the two sites where Curiosity and Perseverance are exploring uh, respectively. Given the age of those rocks, uh, I don't expect any um, long information biomolecules to have persisted. Mm -hmm. But there was just recently a, uh, a paper that came out from the gas chromatograph mass spectrometer team on the Curiosity rover uh, showing additional indications of somewhat complex aromatic hydrocarbons in uh, the, um, the dune materials and, and other materials in, in Gale Crater. So um, we do have a means for analyzing organics. Um, I don't think we'll find much beyond a, an interesting organic stew of stuff. Um, if we were to find, say, nuclear bases, that would be obviously phenomenal. But there again, you don't see DNA in the oldest rocks on Earth. And right. so by analogy, I'd, I'd 
they're not going to see anything uh, comparable on Mars, even if uh, if life were quite prevalent. Thank you. And in any case, uh, even in modern living organisms, a fraction of DNA is so tiny that you cannot. Looking at me, you will not, taking my spectrum, you will not find any DNA in it. <laughs> that's that's right, and that's that's uh, you know uh, that uh, that's in large part why uh, lipids, you know, the, the remnants from our cell walls and membranes and stuff, are are part of what uh, has persisted. Uh, they they uh, they're abundant, and in in some ways, they also have a bit of an intrinsic uh, uh, immunity to diagenetic processing and, and radiation processing. Um, whereas those larger molecules need protection. I have a curiosity question, if uh, if Glennis allows me. Uh, if you you mentioned that there is this angle of nine degrees between magnetic axis of Jupiter and uh, rotation axis, was this known to astronomers before missions, or it is the result of missions? And if astronomers knew it, how how was it measured? Right. So. Yeah, um... Uh, I don't actually know if it was known before the Pioneer and Voyager missions actually got out there uh, to verify it. Um, actually, I don't know if, if Bob Johnson is on there. Bob may may know that uh, answer more directly than, than I, I do. But uh, put him on. I, I'm not on. No, I don't know. <laughs> are, 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 Bob, were you, uh, uh, were you just chiming in there? I yeah, they can hear you. Yeah. Oh, oh, you can hear me. Oh, I see. Oh, uh, I don't know. Actually, it's a good question. I think it was known from Aurora and uh, observations of the uh, planet remotely, but uh, certainly the early missions confirmed it. Yeah. Thank you. Could That's you just hear? curiosity. I, I, I didn't good to hear your voice, Bob. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I didn't know I could just shout in this room, so, okay. We hear you loud and clear, that's great. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for it. This is super interesting talk, but unfortunately I have to run right now. Thank you. Hey, uh, my pleasure. Uh, thanks for the great questions. A lot of fun uh, chatting with you all. I'll ask one last quick question following up what you were just saying. Are there any things, I mean, so the DNA, like you were, saying from the beginning would really be a spectacular thing to answer. But are there other, like for example, lipids that would already be a clue that there was some form of life? I mean, are there any residuum in our own? Oh, I see you say the trouble is we're constantly making this stuff. So it's hard to tell what would be and really antique, so to speak, preserved uh, signatures other than something as difficult to find as DNA. Yeah, well, so it's, it's a really interesting question, Gladys, in part because um, when you look at the, the tree of life, you do see a difference in the lipids used. So, for example, the, the, the ancient organics that are found in rocks from Australia and South Africa and Greenland um, are copanes, stearines, and isoprenoids. Uh, each of those is some variation on a, uh, a, a lipid molecule originally uh, from either a um, uh, bacterium, uh, archaean uh, microbe, or eukaryote. And, and so the isoprenoids link to the archaean microbes, the hopanes uh, link to the bacteria, the sterines link to um, the eukaryotes. And so, um, you know, were we to find sterines on Mars, uh, would that implicate a evolution of life's complexity on up to eukaryotes? Um, uh, now there's a lot of debate within the microbial community. What does it really mean to be a eukaryote? Uh, what does it mean to have a, a, a nucleus and stuff? So, so that's a whole different debate. But you know, depending on the nature of the organics that you found, you could potentially make a link to what we see with various lipids in our own microbial tree of life and, and full tree of life. So it doesn't have to wait for the ultimate. I mean, there's things, 
right, salt is is essential to understand. But I was wondering, you know, what would be the next step after salt that's not sort of impossibly far to reach? Well, so the um, uh, our, our kind of strategy with um, uh, what to go after evolves from follow the water to then follow various elements. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, follow the water, then follow carbon. Then after carbon, uh, look for the nitrogen. After nitrogen, perhaps look for the phosphorus. Okay. Um, and an interesting kind of uh, difference between Europa and Enceladus is that um, out at Enceladus, we really don't see much sulfur. Um, whereas at Europa, we see a tremendous amount of sulfur, in part because Io is delivering sulfur from its volcanic eruptions, uh, whether or not some of that sulfur is endogenous coming up from the ocean below, uh, is still an open question. But we at least know that the Jovian system, when these moons form, formed, uh, was quite abundant in, in the, the, the key elements for life, the carbon, the oxygen, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, the sulfur, and of course, the, the hydrogen. Um, does Enceladus, does the Saturnian system have all those elements? You know, if anything, the Saturnian system may have a, a greater predilection or retention of, uh, of carbon as evidenced by, uh, by Titan um, uh, than the Jovian system does. And so that kind of elemental compare and contrast is, uh, is pretty interesting when you look at the, 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 the Jovian subnebula nebula and the Saturnian subnebula for uh, um, forming moons that um, uh, that came out of the elements that were were in the original inventory, and I go into detail on that in the in some of the chapters in my book also. Well, thank you very very much. I give one last opportunity for people in the room to shout a question or people online to raise their hands or shout. And if not, well, thank you again. And, and well, thanks, uh, Kevin. But uh, one question: uh, oh. What about life in Venus's atmosphere? <laughs> Only one minute answer. Oh, oh thirty <laughs> seconds. So, yeah, uh, uh, at least my position on it is, uh, you know, don't, 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 don't poke the astrobiological bear. Um, the, the, uh, okay. Okay. Thank you. I find uh, the, those kind of claims are, are interesting, uh, but uh, boy, the evidence certainly uh, at this point does not live up to the claim. Um, and and so, I've had you mean it might not even be there, or, or it might not be phosphine might not be there, or it might not be uh, uh, biological in origin. Right, right. So um, uh, uh, the, the phosphine detection itself is obviously still up for debate. And, and a lot of teams are doing great follow-up work on that. And um, uh, I'm close colleagues with, with the, the team that uh, was primarily led out of Goddard that said, ah, you know, that, that original phosphine detection was not particularly convincing. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm tracking that quite closely. And it's, the, the pendulum seems to swing a bit back and forth here on that. But even if the phosphine is there, mm -hmm. um, there have been some nice publications on, um, uh, on uh, volcanic um, okay. uh, exaltations and other geochemical mechanisms, even meteorites coming in through the atmosphere, burning up and uh, supplying a sufficient amount of phosphine to explain uh, the, the signal. And one of the things that, as much as I want it to be life, you know, I want to believe I'm a, 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 I would love nothing more than to, to find out that Venus uh, uh, had or has life. Um, but uh, one of the things that's a, a little disappointing is that if in fact the phosphine is there and it's of volcanic origin and implies contemporary volcanism, that's extraordinary. Like, oh, let's, let's not bury the lead. Uh, you know, if, 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 <laughs> if Venus is geologically active today, uh, that's great. So let, let's not necessarily implicate a life uh, unnecessarily and, and, and stretching the interpretation of what's already a debatable measurement. Uh, let, let's stick with the geochemical. Uh, until further notice, let's uh, try and rule out the geochemical. And the geochemical itself is, uh, uh, is quite exciting. Well, that's a great note to end on.
Thank you. And thank you very much, Bob, for suggesting uh, we invite Kevin. It's terrific. Thank you so okay. much, Kevin. Okay. <laughs> Uh, thank you all, and uh, a lot of fun uh, chatting with you, and uh, uh, really fun taking the questions in real time. Thanks, Bob. Take care. Take care, Kevin. Bye, Take care. everybody. Bye.